Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. I suspect that a part of the devil's craftiness is to encourage us to misunderstand the very nature of his strategy. We do know, and rightly so, that the devil is uh, given from time to time to uh, tempt us. In fact, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, uh, we ask that God would uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. They're, they're, those are connected ideas. The devil does love to tempt us. I think where we make the mistake is we think that the function of that temptation from the devil is to, in a sense, lead us away from God by the pursuit of pleasure. That is, when the devil tempts us to do this or to do that, we think that we're going to enjoy it so much that even though God says, don't do this or don't do that, we say, well, I'd rather ditch you, God, than ditch this pleasure, and I'm going to go chase after that pleasure, and the devil has won his victory. The idea is that the devil is trying to get us to sell our birthright for a mess of pottage and that the pottage is really, really good. Well, I, I suppose that could conceivably happen, except for, I would argue, this. The devil has nothing good to offer us, nothing that is ultimately pleasurable. Everything that he tries to trade with us is empty and hollow. But here's what he can do. If he gets us to succumb to this temptation, whether it is a pursuit of some sort of illicit sexual pleasure, whether it is an idolatry of wealth or respect whether it is just plain raw selfishness, uh, whatever it is, his goal in getting us to succumb to the temptation is not to continue to woo us with the same temptation, but rather once he gets us through that door of this particular sin, he turns around and accuses us. You should try this. It'll be good. It's not bad. Nothing wrong with it. It's a good thing. It's a pleasant thing. Try it. Try it. Try it. Look what you did. Look what you did. Now, I know that that makes him look incoherent. I know that it makes him look uh, hypocritical, but I don't think he much cares. I think that's what he does. I think he knows that the real power of our sin is that it can be used not as a pleasure, but it can be used as a cause in us to doubt our Father's love for us. Before we commit the sin, the temptation is to doubt our Father's love for us because he won't let us have this thing that's so desirable. After we commit the sin, he turns around and says, how could God love someone like you? Now, I mention all this because not too long ago, I once again became the object of some uh, internet media conversation uh, on the basis of uh, my uh, opening up of the Shepherd's College, which begins uh, classes at the end of August. And we're taking 
applications. Uh, right now, you can go to Shep dot college shep dot college to check that out but that's not what i'm here to talk about today that's just what gave rise to again this uh, temporary blip in increasing uh internet chatter about what a terrible person i am you see one of the emphases of the shepherd's college is that we believe that it's that we prepare men for gospel ministry by working on their character that academics is the wrong place to measure, that the qualities that the Bible gives of an elder are qualities of character. And so the question is, what on what basis would disgraced pastor R.C. Sproul Jr. think that he's equipped to encourage people and teach on issues of character? Well, what is that? That's, that's an allusion to scandals in my past that are real. In fact, uh, the author of this particular piece, the, the, the font of the conversation, this particular piece, uh, that the author, you know, listed three different specific, um, public scandals dating back to 2006, uh, all of which to one degree or another involve things that, uh, I had some level of guilt in, some more than others. No question about it. How do you suppose it makes me feel when that happens? Do you know that uh, I spend a fair amount of time, not a lot, but I spend a fair amount of time interacting with unbelievers on the Internet. I have another podcast. It's called Ask RC. Uh, part of my goal with the Ask RC podcast, it's only five minutes long, is to uh, answer questions that maybe unbelievers might be asking and to, to start dialogues. And that can create uh, discussions, and it has. And eventually, I know this, that whenever I'm in a discussion with somebody and we're having disagreement and I'm trying to make an argument, no matter how gracious I might be, sooner or later, they're going to say something about my sins. Yeah, well, why should I listen to you? You had no WI. Why should I listen to you? You got caught in the Ashley Madison scandal. Why should I listen to you this? Why should I listen to you that? And it stings. It stings. The, the scars from those sins in my own life, which are sins, are not completely 100% healed. But that's my fault. That's not their fault. And in fact, this is something that God himself uses for my spiritual well-being. One, it uh, pushes me. I don't want to say it keeps me humble because that sounds like I'm bragging, <laughs> but it pushes me in the direction of humility to be reminded of these things. But it should also push me in the direction of renewed gratitude for the fullness of God's forgiveness. When the devil, and that's what's behind all of this. I'm not, I'm not saying these people are devils. I'm not saying they're not even believers. But what's behind all this is the devil trying to tell me, your father doesn't love you. Your father doesn't love you. Your father doesn't love you. But because my father loves me, all it ends up doing is reminding me that my father loves me. My father loves me. My critics hate me. A lot of believers hate me. The devil hates me. But my father, he loves me. In order for the devil to rub my face in my sin, it's not a difficult thing. It's right there. It's close to me. It's close to him. We come together and he pushes my face down into it. But the one thing the devil can't do is carry my sin to the throne of the living God. 
You see, no matter how long he walks carrying my sin, he'll never get all the way from the east to the west. And that is how far my Heavenly Father has removed my sins from me. And friend, if you're a believer, the same is true of you. Now, I can't promise you, and I don't know that I would want to, I can't promise you that sins that you have committed, that you have repented to God for, that are unknown, I can't promise you they won't come out. I can promise you that if they do come out, it'll be for your good and for his glory. And it'll be because he loves you. I can definitely promise you this. If you've repented, they're as far from you as the east is from the west, as far from God as the east is from the west. Don't let the devil beat you. And by beat you, I don't mean have victory over you. I mean pummel you. He will try. He will try to discourage you. But let every bit of discouragement be yet another goad to run toward the cross. When I hurt by God's grace, when I hurt because God's people and God's enemies both think it vitally important to jump up and down and say, don't forget this, don't forget this, don't forget what he did. When that happens, it drives me to my father. And my father loves me. And he is my all in all. He is all that I need. He is all that I want. He is the pearl of great price for which I gladly hand over my reputation, as poor as it may be. You fight the devil not by denying what you are, but by affirming what Jesus is and what he's done for you. There's nothing he can say against our Lord. And so we are always, always safe. And that, friends, that is the message that the church needs to proclaim week in and week out. It's by this message that Jesus changes everything. We come now in our ongoing series on the parables of Jesus to the parable of the lost coin, which is found in Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10, where we read, or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This particular parable in, uh, is given in close proximity to the parable of the prodigal son and uh, another place, the parable of the lost sheep. And you can see there's uh, quite a bit in common among these three. And they all relate very clearly to the tension uh, between Jesus and the Pharisees as it relates to uh, the sinners that Jesus spent his time with. Uh, 
And the message here is very, very clear and straightforward. What Jesus is seeking to communicate is the extreme value that the Father places upon us. Uh, and he's not content with nine out of the ten, but he makes sacrifices uh, in order to uh, maintain and hold on to uh, all those that are his. And that should be a great comfort to us. That said, this particular uh, prodigal, if you will allow me a point of personal privilege, uh, means especially a lot to me. And to explain uh, why, I need to uh, give you a little backstory in my own life. Uh, when I was 15 years old, it was determined by my parents that uh, I should attend a private school uh, to get a better education than I might get uh, close to home. And the particular school that was chosen for me uh, was many states away from where I grew up in western Pennsylvania. The school was in Wichita, Kansas. And so off I went to Wichita, Kansas. And while I was there, I developed a keen interest in the study of theology. And I continued while I was there uh, in the same status that I had always been, wherein I believed that the Bible was the word of God, that uh, God existed, that Jesus was his son, that Jesus lived a perfect life and died in a sacrificial death and was raised from the dead. I believed uh, everything in a manner of speaking that the devil believed and uh, knew that it was true and good and beautiful uh, but also knew my own heart that I wasn't uh, ready to uh, give a full commitment of my life to the service of the Lord Jesus. And so I perceived myself, and I think probably rightly so, I perceived myself as not a believer, but I didn't like the idea of my parents not knowing that. In fact, uh, around this same time, I'd gone through that process in our local church that we call confirmation, where I made a profession of faith to the elders of the church and uh, was invited to come to the Lord's table. And I believed it enough to not partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, but I, on those Sundays when we would have it, I would sit somewhere far from my parents so that they wouldn't know that I wasn't taking it. So I wanted them to believe I was a believer. I didn't believe I was a believer, but I believed the truth of God's word. I remember going to sleep at night and watching this great tree outside my window howling in the south wind of Kansas and thinking, boy, if that tree falls down and kills me, I'm going to wake up in hell. Well, by God's grace, listening to Bob Dylan's second Christian album, Saved, uh, I got on my knees eventually and, and cried out for God's mercy in Christ and uh, confessed the reality of my sins and, and, and my need. And, uh, of course, one of the first things, <coughs> excuse me, one of the first things I did after that uh, prayer was to call my parents back in Pennsylvania and let them know what had happened. Which, of course, was a very awkward conversation in the sense that, again, I had led them to believe that I already was a believer. But when you're excited and you're uh, fresh, freshly reborn, it's uh, you kind of have that courage to be able to have that conversation. So I called them up and I told them and and they were just, of course, uh, delighted and tickled and just grateful to hear this story from me. And uh, I think they probably both wept a little bit and I wept a little bit. And But what I remember more than anything else about that phone conversation is that just before uh, I got off the phone, my dad said to me, son, I want you to know something. I said, what is it, dad? He said, today in heaven the very angels of God are having a party because of you, over you, in honor of you. He told me that because of this promise from Jesus. 
I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I want you to know that too. Whether it was many, many years ago, whether you can't even remember when it happened, whether it was yesterday, the angels in heaven rejoice at God's redemption and adoption of you. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.